I want to read for you today from 2 Samuel chapter 9, 2 Samuel chapter 9, and I want to share a word with you today as we, um, just as we go into this spring season, and um, uh, this is such a powerful season, of course, today is Ash Wednesday, it's the beginning of the Lenten season, which is a season of preparation for, uh, for Easter as we approach the season of Easter and we um, are, are preparing and maybe preparing our hearts. Uh, and there's so many different ways that we can prepare. And I want to talk about one of the ways today that we can prepare for this season. And as this, this preparation is not specifically seasonal uh, because this is something we ought to always be doing, but particularly for this time of year. And it's not just a preparation for Easter. It's a preparation for, uh, we're kicking off a brand new series this week called At the Movies. And it's a lot of fun. It's, uh, it's, it's one of our biggest and uh, most just uh, exciting series of the year. And honestly, it, we, we see more people uh, come to church for the first time and experience God for the first time, hear the good news for the first time. And a lot of people take a first step toward God. They're introduced to the gospel for the very first time. And uh, so I want to talk about some things we can do to prepare for that, to prepare for this season, um, this season leading all the way up to Easter, where people's hearts are just a little bit more open to the message of the gospel. And I want to show you a place in the Old Testament uh, that I think just uh, gives us a glimpse of what the gospel is about and how we can participate in it. In fact, uh, the, the message I want to preach and the text that I want to read for you today um, is the text that I preached from the very first sermon for our, when our church opened up 11 years ago. On October the 10th, 2010, we had this little church service in a high school cafetorium. That means it was a cafeteria with a stage at one end because uh, apparently we don't value the arts very much around here. So we're like, yeah, we're not doing a whole auditorium. We're going to, we'll put a stage on the end of your cafeteria. And, um, it was chicken nugget signs and, you know, you can smell the pizza for leftover from Friday. And, um, but, um, but we, uh, our very first service ever. And the reason I, I preached from this text was because, um, I, I, I think it gives us a glimpse of what grace is all about. And, um, and again, today I want to talk about how we get to be a part of it. Second Samuel chapter nine, beginning with verse one it says one day David asked, is anyone in Saul's family still alive? Anyone to whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake. The king, King David is uh, looking for survivors. Is anyone from Saul's family still alive. Um, there had been an attack. Most of Saul's family had been annihilated. And David is now searching for survivors. We got any survivors in the house? No? <laughs> a few of you. Survive. Uh, being a survivor means you've been through something. But you're still here. Being a survivor means that it hasn't always been easy but you're still here. Being a survivor means that uh, if the enemy would have had his way, you wouldn't be here, but you're still here. So he summoned a man, verse two, named Ziba, who had been one of Saul's servants. Saul was the previous king and the first king of Israel. Saul, along with most of his family, has died in an attack. David is the king who replaces him. And now a former servant of the former king comes forward. And the king asks, are you Ziba? Yes, sir, I am, Ziba replied. The king then asks him, is anyone still alive from Saul's family? If so, I want to show God's kindness to them. This is why I want to talk about this text today because um, David specifically says, David does not say, I want to show you my kindness. David doesn't say, I want to show you how. The word he uses is the Hebrew word chesed. It doesn't just mean being nice. It's covenant kindness. It's covenant loyalty. It's covenant love. It's the kind of love that you have when you don't feel like it. It's the kind of love that you have when they don't deserve it. It's when you swear against yourself. I'm going to do what I say I'm going to do. I'm going to be faithful to you whether you're faithful to me or not. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, 
It's, I mean, it's that kind of, it's not just, I'm going to be nice. And he doesn't say, I'm going to show you how I do covenant. He says, I'm going to show you how God does covenant. I'm going to show somebody God's kindness. I'm about, to, I'm about to give you an object lesson, an illustrated sermon on what God's covenant grace looks like. Yes, Zeba replied. One of Jonathan's sons is still alive, but he is crippled in both his feet. Where is he? The king asked. In Lodabar, Zeba told him, at the home of Machir, the son of Amiel. So David sent for him and brought him from Machir's house. His name was Mephibosheth. That's a mouthful. Mephibosheth. My title today, if you're writing it down notes, is just simply The Invitation. The Invitation. I thought about calling it the Mephibosheth Mission. But I figured at some point I would misspeak and mess it up. The Mephibosheth Mission. The Invitation. Father, right now in Jesus' name, would you open our hearts to your word? Your word is life and light. It's a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. So today, show us what our step is. It's not my brother nor my sister, but it's me, O Lord, standing in the need of prayer. This isn't a word for someone else. I believe that you want to speak to me. Yes, through this ancient text that you breathe new life on, the same spirit that inspired it now whispers it into our hearts and tells us the way that we ought to go. Show us, and we will go in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The, the story of, uh, of, of David and Mephibosheth, um, it's, um, well, it's, it's, it's kind of a long story, but you got to get at least the highlights if you're going to understand what's going on. And, and um, we'll jump into the message in a moment. The story, again, goes back to before David was king, when David was uh, really nobody at all. And King Saul was the king over all of Israel. He was the first king of Israel, and he was, uh, he was a striking character. The Bible says that he was head and shoulders taller than everybody else. He was a handsome man. He was a, 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 an intimidating figure. And Saul was the king. Saul, however, rejected God's ways and rejected God's word. And ultimately, God decided that he was going to find for himself a leader who would have God's heart. And ultimately, that would be fulfilled in the person of King David. Uh, Saul ultimately would meet his end on the battlefield with his son Jonathan at his side. The Philistine armies came in to attack as was often the case, Israel and, and the Philistines were uh, often at war and the Philistines had come and uh, attacked uh, Israel and uh, Saul as the king, along with his men, were defending Israel. Saul dies in battle. Jonathan dies in battle. Word comes back to the capital city that the king has been slain, that Jonathan, who was the heir to the throne, had been slain, and it throws the whole kingdom into chaos. It throws the capital city into chaos because the Philistines were still approaching and they weren't stopping where they were. They would come into the capital city, and was as was normally the case, when you took a city or you took, uh, 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 wanted to take a nation out, uh, you not only killed the king, but you would then uh, make sure to annihilate and assassinate the king's family because you wanted nobody to have a claim to the throne. You wanted to create a vacuum of power. In fact, we probably on the world stage right now, uh, it's possible that we will watch a similar kind of thing uh, millennia later, uh, but but a similar kind of strategy um, that if we can create a vacuum of power, then we can just step in, fill that vacuum, set up our own kind of system and governmental processes. And uh, so this was the intention of the Philistines, and this was the normal course of war in the ancient world. And so Saul is dead and Jonathan is dead, But now everybody who is an heir, everybody who is related to the king, all of the royal family uh, knows that they are uh, targets. They're under attack. One of them is, uh, is Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth was Saul's grandson. 
Jonathan's son, so he was, uh, he was the grandson of, of the king, the son of the crown prince, uh, one day potentially a, a potential heir to the throne of Israel himself. He, uh, at the time, was just a small child and when all of this happened and uh, no doubt didn't understand what was going on. But the story says that Mephibosheth, in the moment when all of this broke out, his nurse who looked after him uh, picked him up. She realized what was happening. She understood the severity of the, of the moment. And so she grabs the boy and in this hysteric moment, she just starts running and she starts just trying to get out of the city because she knows that the, uh, the armies are coming and they'll come to the city and they'll come to the palace and they will hunt down every descendant of the king and slaughter them. They don't care that this is just a baby, just a child. They will kill him and not think twice about it. So she picks the baby up. She picks the child up and she's running with little Mephibosheth and and as she runs outside of the city, at some point, she suffers a terrible fall and she drops the child with such force that his feet are broken and mangled. And for the rest of his life, he becomes crippled in both of his feet. So when we say that Mephibosheth was a survivor, it means one, that he survived an attack from his enemy, but it means also that he survived being dropped by his friend. I found that sometimes it's harder to survive being dropped by someone I trusted than being attacked by somebody I didn't. I expected you to come at me, you know. Like I, 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 I kind of knew that if you got a chance, you would take your shot. But there's some people that you believed in, you trusted in, you put your confidence in. This is someone that Mephibosheth had all the confidence in the world in, and his greatest wound doesn't come from an enemy, but from a friend. David himself said it in one place in the Psalms. He, he, said, he said, if it was my enemy, if, it, if the attack came from out there, I could have borne it. But it was you. The one that I had fellowship with, the one I used to walk into the house of God together with, it was you. But he survives. He survives, but he's still wounded. He survives, but he's still hurting. Uh, at some point, uh, he finds a home in the house of Machir, uh, out in the, in the boondocks of Israel, as far away from the capital as he can get. Over time, David becomes the new king, and this doesn't make Mephibosheth feel any better about life either, because even though the Philistines are no longer in charge, even though the, the, the enemies that attacked him were not still attacking him, there's a new king on the throne. And, uh, and, and even though David was an Israelite, it was, the, it was again, the, the kind of modus operandi of the day that when a new king became king, he would oftentimes exterminate his potential rivals. And so when a new, a new uh, 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 bloodline was introduced, they would try to wipe out the previous uh, kingdom, the previous king's progeny. And so Mephibosheth stays in hiding for his life. Time passes. David is king. David is on his throne. David is perhaps at his table. We don't know where David is at in this moment. But at some point, David remembers a promise that he made to Jonathan. When David and Jonathan were young, uh, David uh, was, was, uh, was just a shepherd boy. Jonathan was supposed to be the next king. And they made a promise that one day uh, when they got older that they would always be friends and they would always have each other's backs and, and, and I'll fight for you and you fight for me, but not just I'll fight for you. Your children will be like my children. My children will be like your children. They made that pact. And when they made that pact, David probably felt like he would get the better end of the deal. Come on. When you, when you go into business with the king, the, with the future king, when you become partners with the prince, you feel like I'm getting the good end of the deal. Somehow Jonathan knew, though, that David himself, David was actually the one who was anointed. Jonathan knew, in fact, he would speak it over David, that God has chosen you. Even though it was Jonathan's place by birth, it was 
David's calling by the spirit. And so Jonathan, even though uh, status said he was getting little and giving much, Jonathan knew that the truth is that I'm going to get more out of this than you think I will. Because one day you're going to be the king and you're going to be in a position in a place of power. Jonathan could not have possibly known how everything would unfold. But now, uh, years later, some almost 15 years later, David is on the throne. He has become the king. Every promise God has, has promised him is coming to pass. But David remembers that there's a promise he's made that he hasn't kept. And so David sets out looking for survivors. David is looking for someone that he can fulfill this covenant with. David swore to Jonathan, I got your back. I'll fight for you and I will fight for your children and your kids will be like my kids and my kids will be like your kids. And as long as there's somebody living from either one of us, we've got each other's backs all the way to, I mean, till, till blood. They, 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 they made a blood covenant. They're like, you know, uh, until death do us part. Like we're going to be boys. We're ride or die. I got you and I've got your people. Your people are my people. And David now realizes that he uh, has been a lot going on and he finally things get settled and everything in David's life is going well. I mean, everything is up and to the right. All of his children are at the table. Everybody's well fed. He started at the bottom. Now he's here. Started at the bottom. Now the whole, like every, uh, all his people. I mean, it's all good now. He, David did. David started as a nobody from no, nowhere, but now he's sitting on the throne. Now he's sitting at the king's table. He's eating good. He's living good. Everything is going well. And yet in this moment, David, David is restless. David's mind, David's not celebrating everybody that's around him at the table. He's not celebrating his beautiful wife. He's not celebrating all of his children. His mind is on the son who isn't here. I want to start by talking about the mission, the mission, because David starts to ask questions. Is there anybody left? Is there anybody that fits the criteria of this covenant that I made with Jonathan? Anyone of the household of Saul? Because I want to show kindness and not just any kindness. I want to show God's kindness the way God does covenant. And finally, they find Ziba who used to serve the king. And they asked Ziba and he said, yeah, there's one, there's one that I know of who, who made it. There's one who got out. There's one who didn't get killed in the whole process. But he's crippled. He didn't get killed, but he did get crippled. Uh, it, it was in the ancient world, it was illegal for a, a person with a significant handicap to come into the presence of the king. You couldn't, like if you were going to come before the king, you had to get yourself right. You had to come, you had to prepare, you had to wear certain things, you had to come in a certain way. There were protocols. You didn't just roll up in your, in your joggers, in your slides, Roll out of bed and roll up to the king. No, 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 you had to get ready. Come on, I got my friends from England in the house today. And, um, and there's some protocols if you're going to go to to the palace, if you're going to go see her majesty, you don't just roll up there any old way. And so one of the rules were, if you, if you were all jacked up, <laughs> you can't cut, like the king don't even want to look at that. And so Ziba said, King, um, there's one that, you know, yeah, there is one, but um, you don't want him. He's messed up. And David's, uh, D David is completely undeterred by finding out that, uh, that the boy is crippled. And he says, I don't care. Where's he at? Can I, just, can I just tell you the good news? That, that God already knows what's messed up about you. And he's already decided that no matter what rule it breaks and what rule he has to bend, that he's going to bless you in spite of you. Can I just give you good news? You don't have to, you don't have to hide it. You don't have to project like you know, some of us. Now we come before the king, we come to church and we try to straighten our legs out real good. And we, we, we put on some, maybe, you know, some, we wear something that doesn't show off our jacked up feet and we try to walk real straight. And if anybody asks us how we're doing, oh, just, it was leg day at the gym. That was, that's, but I'm okay. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. Because we feel like, we feel like uh, um, I, I, can't, I can't come to God like this. I can't bring this to God. I, I, I know, I see what's, in fact, Mephibosheth, the name of Mephibosheth, this is a weird name, but it literally means to turn your face from the shame. 
And a lot of us live our lives that way. We just try to, we try not to look at it. We try to ignore it. But when David calls for Mephibosheth, he doesn't call for him because he's unaware of his problem. He knows his problem, but he still calls for him. He knows his problem, but he still wants him in his presence. And I'm just going to tell you, it doesn't matter who dropped you. It doesn't matter how hard you fell. It doesn't matter how, how messed up you feel like you are. It doesn't matter how long you've been this way. It doesn't matter how how ugly it is. It doesn't matter how much you try to act like it's not there. God already knows and he's already decided that he's going to love you in spite of you. He's going to redeem you in spite of you. The mission. He said, where is he at? They said, Lodabar. Lodabar means, it's a Hebrew word that means no word, no place, nowhere. In the middle of nowhere. He has found the most nowhere place and he's, he's holed up in the house of Machir and David is at his table and everything's good, but the problem is there's an empty seat. The problem is there's room at the table and, and, and meanwhile, Mephibosheth is at Machir's table. Mephibosheth is, is living and he's learned to live on less. I mean, he was a prince. He, he, for the first five years of his life, this is where he ate. For the first five years of his life. Now, I'm like, my, my kids are bougie already about food. I'll be honest with you. My kids, if you know my kids, like they, I mean, I said, like they'll slum it sometimes. They like some Taco Bell. They like some real, like, but honestly, like you ask them what they want, they're going for crab legs. <laughs> they want some lobster tail. I'm not joking. They were like, they, 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 they're, they're going to go, if, don't give them the kid menu. They're going to flip to the real menu and they're going to go all the way to the most expensive thing. I'll take three of those. Like, who are you? You don't work. You don't pay no bills. I'm not even ordering that. <laughs> we took them on vacation recently. The, the favorite thing is that it was all inclusive. They could order whatever they wanted. I'll take that and that. You mean I can order whatever I want as much as, yep. And they were, I mean, just, that's how they were just ordering everything. For five years, Makir had lived like that. He had whatever he needed. But now for the last de several decades, he has learned to live on less. That's the way some of us, we've just learned to live on less. We've learned to get by. We've learned to survive. We've learned just to deal with being depressed. We've learned to deal with being hurt. We've learned to deal with not being fulfilled and, and not being satisfied. You can still eat, but you're never satisfied. That's why you eat and you're still hungry. That's why from relationship to relationship, but you're not satisfied. Or from one job to the next, but you're never satisfied. Because some, listen, when you were, when you were created for the king's table, there's, no, there's nothing else that's going to fill and satisfy your soul. And Makir couldn't explain it, but there's nothing that would satisfy him. David starts asking questions. Where is he at? He's in the house of Makir in Lodabar. And David said this, we're talking about the mission, but I want to pivot because David says this, verse five, it says, David sent for him and brought him from Makir's house. He sent and he brought. He sent and he brought. He sent and he brought. And I want to talk about the method. The mission is the one who's not here, but the method involves those who are. I want to get us ready for this season because this is a season when I believe there's going to be sons and daughters who come home. I believe they're going to be people who are broken that find their way into the house of God. And they said, I didn't even know that I belonged here, but I came to this table and I realized I was born for this. I always knew there was something missing in my life and I found it. But here's the thing. The way that God, the way that God brings them is by sending us. He sent. It's not explicit. But when it says he sent, it doesn't mean he sent a text. He didn't say, hey, you want to come over for dinner? He didn't send a text. He sent a Tim. He didn't send a text. He sent a Tony. He didn't send a text. He sent a Teresa. When God's, he sent and brought, and what he sent was, was not just a word. He sent a person. 
When God wants to bring somebody in, he sends somebody out. So the mission is those who are not here. We're all at the table, and if we're not careful, we get real satisfied being at the table. We, we can get real happy at the table. We got everything we want at the table. Come on, uh, uh, we, we, we can sing his praises, and we can feel his presence, and we get fed by the word, and if we're not careful, we get really well fed, and we get really satisfied, and we just love our place at the table. I grew up in the church that like everybody had their place. I mean, like their seat. I mean, like don't sit in Sister Gladys' seat. Like, bet you won't do it again. And uh, some of you may have a preferred spot, and that's all right. But, but, but if we're not careful, we, we start to love the table so much that we just live for the table, and we eat, and we eat, and we eat. But at some point, the Bible says that David sent and brought in order to bring, he had to send somebody from the table. Because you, you can't bring them to the table if you're not at the table. You can't take somebody someplace where you're not. That's why some of you, some of you are taking advice from people who've never been where you want to go. You're, you're getting marital advice from people who've been divorced seven times. I'm just saying, I don't, I don't know if that's the best way to do it. If you've not been there, I don't probably want to take directions from you. If, I'm, if we're driving, you're and I'm like, well, how do we get? I don't know. I've never been, but turn here. No, that's all right. I'll just, I'll Google it. And so God sends people from his presence to bring people into his presence. In, in fact, this is the call for disciples. Mark 3 and 12, he appointed 12 that they noticed, noticed the, the dual call that we all have, that they might be with him, saved, and that he might send them sent. And, and, and the whole of our Christian walk is this ebb and flow of being brought in and sent out. And if you lack either one of those, you're going to be missing what it means to follow Jesus. Either you're going to be camped out here at the table and become spiritually obese because you, ne- you, you take and you take and you receive and you receive and you eat and you eat and mm, that's a good word and you, and, you, and you get, oh man, that's so good, but you never do anything about it. And you, know, you never go and, 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 and take it and put it into practice. You never bless anybody else. You never serve anybody else. You never go and find somebody else and bring them in. Or, or all you do is go and go and go and you never come back to the presence of God and you end up being emaciated and burnt out and you can't. At some point, I gotta have it. To, like I've got from the abundance of what God has done, freely I've received, now I freely give. The two tables. Uh, this is what it means. When we... When we when we leave God's presence, when we leave God's house, when we leave tonight, when we leave on a weekend, when we, when we get the, the word of God, when we get fed and strengthened and encouraged from God, we, 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 are, we are fed so that we can feed. We've been brought in, brought people, bring people. So now we come, so he called them that they could come and be with him, but then that he could send them out. Come, come, come hang out with me. And then after a while, he's like, all right. Come on, y'all. We all got friends like that. It's not just friends like anybody at some point. That's okay. Love you. Bye-bye. Like, come hang out with me. But at some point, and, and, and if I'm honest with you, some of us, the, the, the version of Christianity that we've prescribed and that we've ascribed to is just, I just want to hang out with Jesus. And listen, you've got to live in his presence. Everything you do has got to come from his presence. But at some point, his presence has to push you out into their presence. Now it creates a dichotomy because now I'm over here. I'm, I'm over here, but I'm not from here. I'm in the world, but I'm not of the world. I can sit at your table, but I don't feed at your table. So I could, Jesus was always, he, was, he, was, he would always be at people's table. He'd be at the table with all the jokers. I mean, everybody who had an issue, Jesus would be right up there at the table. He'd be hanging out, and they'd be like, why is he at the table? 
And so the ability to be in the world, the ability to go, whether into your workplace, to go, to go uh, at your apartment complex, to be wherever you are, and, and to go there, and yet I don't need what, like, I got my, I've got a different source. I'm already full. I didn't come because I need something from you. I came because I want to bring something to you. Now I enter relationships not trying to get something from people. Come on, followers of Jesus. We're not trying to use people. We're trying to bless people because I've been blessed. So you're not my source. So I'm, it's a, most, people, most people who've been dropped have been dropped because they got used. Because people saw them as a resource. People saw them as a source. People saw them as a way to get something. Some of us in relationships got burned because all we were was a, a way for somebody to get their needs met. But when I come into relationships, when I come into, that when I come and sit down, but I've already ate. ate. Jesus did this. Jesus would go into places and they'd be trying to feed him. And he'd be like, I already ate. His disciples brought food one day. He's sitting, he's sitting at the table by a Samaritan woman. He's sitting at the well, but he turned into a table and, and they try to come to feed him. And he said, I have food you know not of. They said, who? Chick, Chick-fil-A's clothes on Sunday. What? And we know Jesus would only eat the, you know, the holy bird um, from Chick-fil-A. And they didn't get it. And what he's saying is, see, Jesus would, this is the way Jesus lived his life. He would say, there'd be all these crowds and there'd be all these people, there'd be all this pull, there'd be all this ministry. And the Bible and Jesus would all of a sudden be like. And he'd get along with the father and he'd go up a mountain and he'd spend the night in prayer and he'd get with God and he'd get, and he'd receive and he'd get filled. And, and then, but you know what he didn't do? He didn't stay on the mountain. Then he come down the mountain and the Bible says, and he came out of the wilderness full of the Holy Spirit and he began to minister. And so this is the calling because this is the method that God accomplishes his mission. He doesn't send, he doesn't send a text message. He sends you. He sends his people. I don't know if you understand this. The church is it. For like the, when Jesus made the plan, and I don't know, I've seen, like I've seen the church. Sometimes I'm not impressed. I felt like I, I feel like, man, you might want a plan B, G. <laughs> G. I'm just saying, you know, I don't know. They know we kind of messed up. Just like, no, this is this is my plan, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. I'm gonna I'm gonna bring people who are crippled and broken and jacked up and messed up and I'm going to heal them and redeem them and bless them and forgive them and fill them with so much love and then they're going to go back and they're going to because they brought him but he was crippled. So it says they brought him but it really means they carried him. Crippled in both. He couldn't walk at all. I'm sent to bring But in order to bring, I have to be willing to carry the weight of people. And some of us, listen, I I want to tell you, God God loves you. God wants you in his presence. Like first and foremost, that dual calling begins with, come be with me. Come have a relationship with me. But as long as there's an empty chair, as long as there's a hurting son, as long as there's someone who's broken, as long as there's someone in our city who's far away from God, like we get fed, but we don't get fed just to be fat. We don't get fed just to keep eating. We don't be fed. Oh, that's a good word, preacher. Like it's only a good word if you go out and do it. Well, that was a good word. Did you do it? Well, (laughs) I mean, that was a good word. It's a good word, but you still ain't done it. The, the, the mission is people, but the method is also people. Because at some point you got to get up from the table. That's what Jesus does in John 13. The Bible says, and he got up from the table and began washing the disciples' feet. And, and the problem with some of us is we never get up from the table. We've always put ourselves in a posture to be served. 
to be fed, to be blessed. And listen, God blesses you, but he blesses you to be a blessing. You are blessed to be a blessing. You are, you are gifted. You are anointed. He, he, your cup overflows, but the reason it overflows is so that you can pour out into somebody else. Not just so you got a big puddle on the table. If my cup overflows, but I'm still sit, sat at the table, then nobody gets, all it is is a mess. But if I go to where thirsty people are and I'm overflowing, then people who don't have any grace or hope or joy can get some. And I just want to challenge this because, I, listen, I want you to be at the table. I'm telling you, I, if, if you can spend your whole life living on less, but you'll never be satisfied anywhere else. I promise you won't. One theologian just said there's a God-sized hole in every human's heart. And you can try to fill it with a thousand things. You can try to fill it with relationships with men or with women. You can try to f- fill it with money. You can try to fill it with, with accomplishment. You can try to fill it with, with, with adventure. You can try to fill it with whatever you want to. But at some point, you, you can eat and eat and eat and never be satisfied. But Jesus said, if you eat the bread that I offer, if you drink the drink that I offer, you will never thirst again. You'll never get hungry again. And when I'm not hungry and thirsty, I can go and again, I can go and sit at the table and I can serve and not have to be served. When my cup is filled, not, not from other people. When, when I don't live for the approval of people because I have the affirmation of God. When, when, I don't, when I don't need people to fill me up because I've already received, I'm already over. Now I can go to give. I can go to share. I can go to bring. And so, and so he sent them and brought him because we are both the object of God's love And we are also the expression of God's love. You are the object and the expression. So God loves you, but God also loves through you. But he can't love through you until you let him love you. You can't feed somebody until you eat. Don't put the oxygen mask on them until you put it on yourself. (laughs) But once you put it on yourself, don't sit there... This is good air. Mm, I'd never, you know, I didn't realize I was never just breathing full oxygen. This is, I just feel like, I feel like I could run a marathon. How y'all doing? Everybody like, uh, the, the cabin's falling apart. The windows are all busted out of the plane. They can't breathe, but you're just like, oh, I just praise God. I'm, I just feel so, this, I just feel so, that's an anointing in this, in this room. Pray, hallelujah. Like, Like you got to get connected to the source, but the reason you get connected to the source is so that you can connect somebody else. Put the mask on, like breathe, get connected with God, but then go and do something and bring somebody else. And they went and they brought him. He couldn't have come on his own. They brought him and the Bible says, as we close in verse six, when he came to David, he bowed low to the ground in deep respect. And David said, greetings, Mephibosheth. Don't be afraid. I intend to show kindness to you because of my promise to your father, Jonathan. I will give you all the property that once belonged to your grandfather, Saul. And you will eat here with me at the king's table. This is part I'll call the message. We're done. Quick, wherever you are. Be quick. There he is. They don't call him quick for nothing. That is, that is his name. Unless D stands for don't be quick. We'll call this, this part the message, the mission. I, I don't know if it strikes you, but I just, um, the fact that the king of glory, lacking nothing, needing nothing, all of the heavens and earth created for his pleasure, enthroned on the heavens, 
and that there would be a moment when he said, something's missing. And not something, but someone. That God would be mindful. Who am I that you are mindful of me? That you even would think about me. That you would sit on your throne and one day say, whatever happened? Is there anybody left? That, that, that David's mind goes past the table to someone who is in the middle of nowhere, feels forgotten about, living on less, and convinced that he's going to live the rest of his life eating in the crumbs when one day he had been eating at the king's table. But redemption means that God restores everything that was lost. See, if, if God hasn't restored it all, then he's not done. Because what Jesus does on the cross is restores every lost thing and every broken thing. And so the land that you lost, you get it back. The title that you lost when you fell, you get it back. The position, the power, the possessions, you get them back. But the greatest gift is that you, you get to eat at the king's table for the rest of your life. The Bible goes on to say that he came in and the Bible says he ate like a king's son for the rest of his life. He didn't just eat at the table. He, just, he didn't just eat with the king's sons. He ate like a king's son. You know how a prince eats? Any way he wants. I had three of those. That's, that's the problem. My, my kids think they, they, they think they're royalty. They are. They're the king's kid. And when you realize who you are, when you realize the bill's already paid, when you realize, when he said, you'll eat at my table, what he said is, I'll cover it. I'll cover it. Well, well how much is it going to be? I already paid it. Don't worry about it. I already, like, I got it. I got you covered. And then literally as he sits down at the table and the tablecloth drapes over those broken feet, when he said, I'll cover it, he wasn't just talking about the price of the meal. He was just talking about everything that had kept him away from the presence of the king. And he gives him his confidence back. I'm not just eating what they eat. I'm eating like they eat because I belong here. And you know why I belong here? Because there's only one way to get to this table. By invitation. You know, you know why? You know why you don't have to? I don't care where you've been and what you've done. You know why you don't have to hang your head when you come here to Elevate Life Church and you come, you sit whatever seat you want to. Sister Gladys, if you beat her here, you go ahead, take her seat. And you can sit on down and you can square your shoulders and you can say, God, I just, I'm believing for, for you to speak to my life and I'm receiving your grace and I'm getting everything that I need. And you know why? Because you belong here as much as anybody. Because there's only one way to the table and that is that the king invited you. And if he invited you, it doesn't matter who you are or what happened or how bad your feet are or how bad your past is or what you did or what they did to you. Well, I just, I didn't grow up in church. If he invited you, it don't matter. Your religious pedigree does not get you a seat at this table. Your good works do not get you a seat at this table. Because the message, the invitation is three parts. It's one, your pain does not define you. Two, your past does not disqualify you. And three, your performance does not deliver you. You, you don't earn your way here. You have to be carried. Nobody, nobody strolls into the kingdom. Nobody saunters 
to the king's table. The only way you come is through brokenness and humility and realize I can't even come. The Bible says nobody can even approach unless the spirit carries him, draws him, brings him. So here's what I want us to do. Um, in just a minute, we're going to pray. And, and, you know, in this story, there's three primary actors as we've told it today. One is the king. You ate him. Two are the servants. You may be them. Whoever, I, we don't know who, but whoever went and brought people who have been fed, people who have been blessed, people who have been saved, people who have received, people who remember what it was like when they were living on less, people who remember what it was like when they had no hope and no peace and no joy, but God has transformed their lives. And we're going to pray in a second for those of us who are at the table who need to lead, get up from the table and we need to go bring somebody else to the table. And then finally, there's some of us that may be Mephibosheth. People who are just living beneath our God-called means. People who are not living. We're, we were created to be close to God, but we're living far away. And it's not that you, I mean, you're making it. You survived. You're getting through it. But you're living on less. And all the while, you know something inside of you is saying there's got to be more. And I don't know why, but I just feel like there's something more. And the message is, not only is there more, but you're invited. There's a place for you. So let's bow our heads and let's take a moment and pray before we get out of here this evening. If you're here today, and, and, and if you could be honest and say, Tim, I'm not, I'm not that close with God. Whether that was a conscious decision or it's just been the ebb and flow of my life, Mephibosheth did not make a plan to leave the king's table, to leave the palace. Life happened. Tragedy happened. Adversity happened. And before he knew it, he was a million miles away. At least it felt that way. And maybe right now you say, Tim, I'm, I, I, I know I'm not close to God, but I know I feel like I'm supposed to be. I just feel like there's more. And here's the good news of the gospel is there's only one way to the table and that's by invitation. And you have one. God didn't send a text. He did send his word and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. He sent a person. He sent Jesus to communicate the fact that there was a place for you. I'm going to show you kindness for Jonathan's sake. Not because you were good, not because you deserved it. God shows you grace because of Jesus' sake. For Christ's sake, you are saved. And if you can just put your faith in that and you can take your seat and you are adopted into the family of God and you eat like a king's kid, because you are a king's kid and you spend the rest of your life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. If you're here today and you say, Tim, that's me. If, if I'm somebody in this story, I'm not the king and I'm probably not right now the servant. I think I'm the guy who's far away. Then today's your invitation to come home. And if that's you, just pray this prayer in your heart right now. Just you and God, answer the call. RSVP, reply to the invitation. 
Come on, right now. Pray it in your heart while I pray it out loud. God, we just thank you. I thank you that you that you're mindful of us. I thank you that, God, who are we? That you would even think of us, the God of the universe, the creator of all things. And yet, God, you love us with an everlasting love. And yet you have sent your son with a message of hope and redemption. And today we receive it and we say, yes, we're coming. We may come crippled, but we're coming. We may be broken, but we're coming. We may be hurting, but we're coming to your table. We're gonna receive all the good things that you have prepared through Jesus Christ and his life and his death and his resurrection. Forgiveness, we receive it as King's children. Mercy is ours. Healing is the bread of the children. Redemption and restoration of all things, we receive it right now in Jesus' name. The favor of God, we receive it. And we eat the only thing that can truly satisfy and we drink the only thing that can truly fill. We thank you for it. And God, I wanna pray for those who tonight said, God, you know what, I'm, I'm, I used to be that guy far away. I used to be that person living my life on less, but God, you changed my life. And there's so many of us in here who could tell our stories. You've brought us into your house. You've brought us into your family. You've sat us at the table. You filled our lives with good things. You called us in, but now you're sending us out. And I pray over your people right now that you would not let us sit at the table, fill our souls while sons and daughters of God live and die without hope in the world unaware of who they are and whose they are. Living in a place with no word and no hope because they just don't know that there is a God who loves them. There is a place for them. So God, today we get up from the table and we go. Send us so that we can bring them We pray it in Jesus' name, and everybody said amen. Amen. Come on, give him praise.